Welcome to The Sword and the Trowel, a podcast of Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries exists for the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of churches. I'm Jared Longshore. And I'm Tom Askell. Thanks so much for listening to The Sword and the Trowel today. So glad to have you with us. And we would love to have you with us in January, January 21st through the 23rd. We're having our conference, The Only God. It is on the doctrine of God. And we've got a wonderful list of speakers. We've got Vody Bacham, and you'll be speaking. I'll be speaking. Chad Vegas will be preaching God's word. James Dolezal as well. Well, and then we have um, Virgil Walker and Daryl Harrison, the Just Thinking podcast guys that are going to come to a live podcast with us. Uh, man, we're going to have so many exhibitors that are coming to this. I'm excited about just a great space yeah. has been provided from a local church down here. So you can still register at founders.org. Check that out January 21st through the 23rd, but you have a way to extend it on Wednesday and Sunday. That's right. We have a pre-conference with Vody Balcom speaking Wednesday night, January 20th. And then we also have uh, Vody scheduled to preach in our church on the Sunday following. So come early and stay late and enjoy all of the blessings that will be afforded to us here in Southwest Florida in January, which is also just a great time of year. It's a wonderful time. Yeah, so we look forward to having you joining us. Uh, we have our Wheel the Sword project that is in full swing now. Season one is being released, even mm-hmm. as we have this podcast today. And uh, we actually have a matching gift set up for those who want to support the season two and season three of Wheel the Sword. And that's going to, we just were able to extend the matching gift. And it's actually going to be extended to the end of November. So if you're able to give, Whatever you give will be doubled, mm-hmm. and we're very excited about season two. We've got people locked in already coming yeah. to uh, be a part of season two. Vody Bacham's going to be a part of season two, and we're going to have uh, Chad Vegas as well dealing with missions, and it's just going to be a wonderful season. So be praying for that endeavor. If you want to check out season or episode one, which Tom did on the word and the world, you can find that on Amazon Prime. And if you don't have Amazon Prime, then you can join the FAM, our Founders Alliance membership and you can get access to the armory where we have all sorts of content there, including the episodes from Wield the Sword. Yeah, I've been told too that it's uh, finally available in Amazon Prime UK. So uh, if you are watching or listening from the United Kingdom, check it out, make sure that it exists there. We've been told it's there. Uh, or, you know, you could just what, cancel your Prime membership and join the fam and th- so you can get it there, right? There you go. That's <laughs> what you could totally do. Uh, for those of you who are not a part of the fam, you can check that out at founders.org. There's three different ways that you can join us and support us on a monthly basis. And if you do that in the month of November, we're actually giving away one of these free The Sword and the Trowel mugs. So I'd love for our, that be our gift to you if you sign up in November. Yeah, you know, I, I've, uh, I've been traveling a little bit the last few weeks and I've been with different groups of pastors and had wonderful conversations with with brothers in uh, three different states now. And I'm encouraged with what's going on in a lot of churches. And uh, a couple of those pastors, uh, their churches are Founders Alliance churches. So they've come on board. Their churches have put us in the budget. We're so grateful for that. I mean, mm. I, we can't do what we're doing uh, without the kind of support that we have. People pray for us and people are supporting this work financially. And that's that's wonderful. I mean, we, we got lots more things we want to do. But the Founders Alliance churches and these, the other pastors were asking, well, what's involved in that? You know, how come I've never heard of that? Well, you know, it's, it's our, our fault. We don't talk about it a lot. But we want you to know that if you're part of a church that's benefited from Founders Ministries or appreciates what we're doing, we would love to have your church consider uh, supporting this ministry as well. And uh, what do we do? We could we'll send a coffee mug to the pastor, right? If the church comes on board. Or, hey, that sounds right to yeah, me. I mean, surely, like surely we will. So that we encourage you. If you want more information about that, you can contact Jared or me and we'll be glad to talk to you about more specifics. Yes. Well, we know that we live in crazy times right now and we're seeing um, a worldview manifests itself in our society and the way that things are functioning all around us. We've been talking about this for a good while. And Tom and I have written a book. It's called Strong and Courageous, Following Jesus Amid the Rise of America's New Religion. And certainly there's nothing new under the sun. And so if you ask us to detail what's the exact nature of this new religion you're talking about, well, we're not saying that we can point to all of the different um, details of the new religion, but we can certainly see a faith commitment that is not 
the biblical faith, a commitment to a king that is not a commitment to Jesus Christ, the king manifesting itself all around us. And it really is going to take strength and courage to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we want to get into the topic that you addressed in Wield the Sword. The first episode was about the word mm-hmm. and the world. These two ideas coming together. We see many ways that uh, we people can say, well, I'm committed to the word, but it doesn't seem to have an impact on the world or we don't see how it's related to what's going on in the world. And so you did a wonderful job of dealing with that, Tom. Why don't you kind of give us an idea of what you talked about? Yeah, well, the world doesn't exist apart from the word. I mean, God spoke the world into existence and sometimes we lose sight of that. And so I'm just always advocating coming back to basic principles. You know, how are we, how did we get here? Who are we? Why are we here? Of course, none of those questions can be answered apart from Genesis. And you read what God reveals in Genesis about how everything came into existence. There was Mm. nothing that existed outside of God prior to God speaking the things that exist into existence. So it's by the word of his power that all things exist. It's by the word of his power through his son that all things are now held together. And it is through the ministry of his word and spirit that he is making himself known savingly in the world through what he's done in the word incarnate Jesus Christ. So, yeah, we just we can't we can't assume that we can understand this world how to live in this world apart from the word of God. I mean, God has spoken. He speaks in nature, creation, the heavens declares glory, but he has spoken to us in specific ways, revealing his salvation in Christ through the written word. And, you know, I I get it. People think sometimes the Bible's not relevant, but whenever I hear people talk too long or too much about that, I wonder if they've ever really read the Bible. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have. Yeah, And, And of course you see the foolishness of the comment when you make this connection, how could the Bible, which is the word of God, be irrelevant in the world that God created by his word? That's right. And so it's the, it, the creation, man, this is so wonderful. You detailed this so well in the first episode about if you could go back, I mean, imagine you could go back to the creation of the world, to those six days in which God created the world as we know it. And, if you're there and you just take the truth that God is eternal. So no beginning to him, no end. He's outside of time. He just is. God is in no creation yet. And then out of nothing, something out of nothing, <laughs> God creates. And that's amazing enough. And you're like, wow, maybe he would, just, maybe he won't tell us how he did it. Maybe we will just know that he did it, that cre- that he brought forth creation. And, but then we actually know how, if you say, how did he do it? Like how did, how did trees and birds, like where'd they come from? Or, you know, they came out of nothing in one sense. And then, but the word, the word, he mm. spoke. Let he, there be. Let there be. And, and God said, and it was so. And so we so often don't think about the world that way. Mm -hmm. And it's really, in many ways, it's a recovery of uh, general revelation. And by general revelation, for those who are not aware, we're talking about there's a doctrinal difference between general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is what God has revealed through creation, through providence. And then special revelation is what God has revealed through the prophets and the apostles, through the God's word now in scripture. And so, you know, they're different, but certainly they're both divine revelation. They're Mm -hmm. both the word of God. And just thinking about a tree, like in one sense, when you're looking at a tree, you're looking at something that came to be from God's word. Like Mm -hmm. that. So when you hear in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Yeah. And it's and the proclaiming is not really just the stars or the tree or the ants, but the God who made them speaking to us through them. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, what a silly thing. Of course, his word through the prophets and the apostles are relevant. I mean, it's the the very creation itself is is here because he spoke. Yeah. And and creation don't lie. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's a. you know, those of us that understand uh, scripture the way we do and are conservative Christians, we say the Bible is inerrant. Well, so is nature. 
Mm-hmm. You know, nature is inerrant. It inherently declares the glory of God. That doesn't mean we infallibly understand it and we can misconstrue it. And certainly that happens all the time. People look at the creation and worship it rather than the creator. And that's our problem innately. But creation tells us the truth about God. And the word, the written word, gives us wisdom to understand this more and more. So the more you understand the Bible, the more you spend time in hearing from God through the ministry of his word, written word and spirit, then, I mean, you know, the, there are those songs about the grass is greener, the sky is bluer. And it's true. It's because you recognize this is indeed our father's world. God mm-hmm. created all of this. And of course, in the Bible, we, we learn not just about created nature itself. We learn about history and the fact that that history really is his story. This is what God is doing. We're all part of this. And that's amazing. You you think about, you know, God is is, uh, telling a story over all of human history. And we're a part of that, you know, and our part may be down here in a a little nondescript corner, but, but we have a role to play in what God is doing for all of eternity in this space and time we know as history and history gains significance all history all human history gains significance based upon what god did whenever he sent his son into space and time and the person of jesus christ when god became flesh so that everything before that gains its significance relative to that coming event everything after that has significance in relationship to that past event so here we are on the other side of it and life has meaning purpose we can gain some great measure of understanding about all of that because of what god did when he invaded space and time when he came in the person of his son Mm -hmm. to live in complete conformity to the commandments that he had given to his image bearers And then as Jesus laid down on the cross and gave up his life for the sake of sinners so that our sins could be atoned. And then when he split the grave and came back from the dead, never to die again. So there's a, there's a human being that died 2000 years ago that's still alive today and will never die again. Mm. I mean, all of that fits into what the scripture tells us that God is doing with his creation. So yeah, I, I don't, it's just hard to be patient with people who think that the Bible's not relevant. I think not relevant. You know, it's, how, how, it's like your eyes not being relevant to sight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioning our Christ and the work that he's done for us and connecting that to the word, right? God created, God created the world by his word. And then the apostle John tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And this God, who is the Word, Jesus Christ, we hear in John one fourteen, and the Word became flesh. Mm. And, you know, if, if you think that you've somehow exhausted the wonder of the Incarnation, then, um, well, you haven't, and, <laughs> you, and you can connect this idea. So, you know, God, God created the world through His Word, and then the Word became flesh Mm -hmm. the word became flesh and dwelt among us and then the word died Mm -hmm. and then the word rose again and so the we have the the resurrected word jesus christ in whom we now have trusted and we are in christ the word and the word is in us and we're walking around on the world that god made by his word proclaiming the truth of the word to this lost and dying world and we're seeing the kingdom of the word of christ advance uh, on earth as it is in heaven and so um, when it, you come there's so much mystery and glory packed in the idea of the connection between um the word and the world then you you deal with really 21st century evangelicalism particularly in our time in america and the trouble seems to be we have found a way to say well we're word people but it's like the word in our bedroom Mm. it's not the word in the world it's like our lives are like the word and maybe the word and even the church but it's the word in my home and the word in my devotion and coffee and Bible time on Insta, put on Instagram. <laughs> oh, wait, the light's not quite right. Instagram. 
But it's like, but what about the word in the world? What about that acts vision of the word kept advancing? Yeah, well, the the word has creative power in the with the ministry of the spirit. I mean, the spirit uses the word to change people. I mean, and we've seen people change. We've seen cultures change. We've seen history changed by the ministry of the word in the power of God's spirit as God's people like you and me, just flesh and blood people who've come to know this living God through Christ have taken that word seriously and gone out and sought to make that word known. I mean, where the Bible has gone, civilizations have been transformed and, and people have been, uh, renewed in their relationship to their creator and to one another. I mean, you just see this. Look at Scotland. You know, Scotland's the nation that was born in a day as the Reformation fires of God's word spread throughout that land and uh, the, the whole communities were changed. We've seen it here in the United States and Western frontier in the late 18th, early 19th centuries where there was a place in uh, the what's now Tennessee and Kentucky called Rogue's Harbor and the Cumberland Valley area where there was no, no law west of the Alleghenies. And so, you know, all the criminal elements would try to cross over the Alleghenies and get away from the law and judges and sheriffs and such. And Rogue's Harbor was completely transformed in the early days of the uh, Second Great Awakening by the preaching mm. of the word. And this has just happened time and time and time again. So, yeah, the, the word is incredibly relevant because it is incredibly powerful to make people right with God. I'm regularly, especially in these last, uh, you know, couple of decades or so of my life, uh, drawn again to Paul's last letter that we have in the New Testament, you know, second Timothy. I mean, again, I think as a pastor and, and coming to the, you know, final laps of my own race, uh, to say, well, man, what was on Paul's mind? You know, what did Paul say? And so I've just really spent some time thinking about this and I'm, I'm drawn to it. I'm, I haven't come close to <laughs> exhausting it. I'm, I'm just drawn to it. But in second Timothy three, he, he says to Timothy, last letter he's going to send to Timothy, as far as we know, nothing, the last thing we have from him in the Bible, he says, in, in, in the last days, perilous times will come. You know, and of course, I, mean, I grew up in an era, in a place where the last days, you say last days and people think Tim LaHaye, you know, or they think uh, uh, the late great planet Earth or, you know, all those mm -hmm. kind of apocalyptic type of uh, scenarios that have been played out saying this is what's going to happen in the last seven years, the last three and a half years where Jesus returns. That's not what the New Testament means by that phrase at all. I mean, we know that's true because he gives us specific instructions to Timothy about what to do in the last days when perilous times come. And what he's talking about there is the same thing he means in Ephesians 6 when he says in the evil day, and there's going to be an evil day. So there are going to be perilous seasons that happen in the last days from Christ's first coming to his second coming. And he gives specific examples of what those perilous days will look like. He says people will be lovers of self rather than lovers of God. They'll be proud, arrogant, boastful, you know, abusive to parents. I mean, there's just, he gives a litany of things. And you look at it and you say, yeah, it kind of sounds like yesterday. You know, that sounds like what we read about every morning when we open our computers and turn to our news sources and uh, see what's happening here. And he's describing a world that's gone mad. And then he goes on to describe how there will be people who also have an appearance of godliness but deny its power. Uh, they will want to have uh, teachers that tickle their ears. They won't put up with sound doctrine in chapter 4. And Paul's not talking about the world anymore. He's talking about people in the church. And he, he gives Timothy two specific instructions. When the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and when the world has infiltrated the church such that you've got folks who are always learning, never coming to a knowledge of the truth, and they are deceptive, they're taking um, weak-willed women captive, they're, you know, just this is happening inside the church. What does he tell Timothy to do? Well, I think it's in verse 14 of 2 Timothy 3. He says, you continue in the word. You continue in the word that you've known from the time you were a child. These holy scriptures are able to make you wise to salvation, verse 15. And then in chapter 4, preach the word. Mm -hmm. So personally, continue in the word, and then publicly, your duty, preach the word in season, out of season. What, so what's our hope whenever everything seems to be coming apart at the seams in our society? It's the word. Stay yep. in the word. What's our hope in the church? It's preach the word. When people don't want to hear the word, what are you supposed to do? Preach the word. We don't have a plan B. Yeah, and you, you have this, um, I, I do think we're, sometimes we miss the, the truth that the word of God always accomplishes 
its that's purpose right. That's right. in the world. And this is what the prophet Isaiah is talking about, Isaiah 55, mm-hmm. 10, where God says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the challenge is the word does it. It's, it's dangerous. It doesn't always do what you think it will do. But it's always going to do what God purposed right. it to do. I mean, imagine being Isaiah, you know, in, in Isaiah 6, and you just come out of your seminary church growth class, and God says, go preach until they're, until they're deaf. Mm. And then you go preach, and, like, everybody rejects you. But wait, but wait, you know, you taught me in my church growth class. <laughs> uh, my church growth class said it's got to go this way, but sometimes it doesn't. When the word of God is preached, sometimes people's hearts get hardened. Yeah. And that's actually the purpose for which God sends it forth. Sometimes it, it pushes back our enemies. Sometimes it converts people who hate God and then they become faithful Christians. But it is always doing it. Sometimes it convicts us and cuts us. Sometimes it encourages us, but it's always at work. I saw this in um, in First Samuel with with Saul, who so desperately wanted a word from God. He had God said, "I'm not speaking to you anymore." And you know, Saul tries to hear from God through the prophets, doesn't work. He tries to hear from him by dreams, the mm-hmm. kingly way, doesn't work. He tries to hear from him through Urim, but the priestly way, and that doesn't work. But he goes down to this witch's house, and he wants to get a word from the dead prophet. So how <laughs> he's twisting things so desperately. But even then, the prophet does come up, and the prophet gives him the word. Israel's going to be handed into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. And that word brings Saul to the ground. He falls down. It's still the word. It was it was from a dead prophet. It was the word that resulted in Saul being dethroned down mm-hmm. to the ground. And when you have that confidence in the Bible, just open that thing and let it rip. Just teach it and know that it's going to accomplish God's purpose in the world. Yeah, and, and that's the hope of uh, every preacher. It's the hope of every Christian. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 that it's he has thanks God because in Christ he always leads us in triumph, uh, in a triumphal pre- procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we're the Rome of Christ to life to life and death to death. Life to life to those who hear and believe, death to death to those who uh, reject and are perishing in their sin. That's a sobering thing. I, I think, you know, if, uh, if there was going to be anything that drove me out of the ministry early in, in my pastoral ministry, it's that very thought that when I'm preaching and I taught somebody, I try to plead with people to come to Christ and they reject that and walk off that, you know, it could well be that I'm just an aroma of Christ to them as death is to death and that they will perish in their sins with the sound of the gospel from my voice in in their heads. That's a sober, sober thought. But Paul says, thanks be to God, because that is a joyful uh, procession. That's a joyful ministry. That's a joyful privilege to be able to be the aroma of Christ, even uh, to people who are perishing because Mm -hmm. they reject the message. But the bottom line, again, it's not, you know, we, we take it personally and you feel you know, personally rejected, personally hurt. But the, the reality is they're walking away from the, the word of God that brings life yeah. to all who believe. Yeah, if there was ever a time where we need God's word at work in our world, within our own nation, what's going on, we need to see the applications. We need to see the implications. We need to actually take up the sword of the spirit and wield it where the battle is hot. For far too long, we've been saying, well, we're committed to the word and we believe it's inerrant and we believe it's sufficient and we believe it's authoritative and we believe all of these things about it, but we're actually not using it. We're mm-hmm. actually, the, the, the sword wasn't meant to just sit there on the mantle. The sword was was meant to be laid hold of and employed in the battle. So if you haven't got a chance to check out that first episode, Tom did a wonderful job on the word and the world, and we haven't just repeated it here. We've been riffing off of these are been applications mm-hmm. of your first episode, and then more episodes are soon to come. Again, you can check that out on Amazon Prime, or you can join the fam, and then you catch it in the armory. We hope that it blesses you.